Hello there. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Thanks for joining us in this webinar. We have Tom Rundle, application engineer from Yamaha UK. My name's Andy Cooper from the Yamaha Research and Development Center based in the UK. We are in a video studio in the town of Milton Keynes, known for its thousand roundabouts, or maybe more. Have you counted them? <laughs> no. Okay. <laughs> Just <laughs> hypothesizing. Okay. No, yeah, known for a thousand roundabouts and its concrete cows. <laughs> We're about 100 kilometers north of London, if you were wondering. Um, anyway, thank you for joining us. This is a webinar about how to live stream a socially distanced orchestra, something we never dreamt about a year ago. <laughs> Strange things have been happening this year. Um, anyway, Tom has had the privilege of working quite closely with the team from the London Symphony Orchestra. Guess what town they're based in? <laughs> anyway, no, they have a venue called LSO St. Luke's. Used to be a church, didn't it? It did, yes. Tom, and now it's, yeah, a lovely venue. They, previously they rehearsed there and used it as an education facility, but, um, this year they've repurposed it as a live streaming venue. So we're going to find out about that transformation, what equipment they used, how they did it. Um, that venue is very close to the Barbican, which is a concert venue in London where LSO have, have done a lot of concerts. Even if you've never been there, I bet you have heard LSO perform. Why would that be? Because they're very famous. <laughs> they're very famous. <laughs> and they've played in a lot of movies, haven't they? They have, yes. Some of your yeah. favourites, perhaps. Star Wars. Star yes. Wars. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, I'm sure you've all heard a uh, product from LSO. Tom, when did you first experience an orchestra? This goes back to when I was quite young. Uh, oh, it was you still are quite young. Yeah, yeah, thank you. That's very kind. <laughs> 10 or 11 years old, I used to play uh, the cello in a youth orchestra, uh, but I wasn't very good at it. So I, oh. uh, I switched to the, the, the backstage, the technical bit of it, uh, pretty, pretty soon on. So I think I played for a couple of years. Uh, yeah. Okay. Well, you've certainly found something to excel at. Thank now. you. That's very kind. Of you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I played the oboe in the orchestra when I was a teenager and, and a student. Quite enjoyed that. But yes, my first experience of orchestras then was, was probably rather out of tune. But I think you never, you never forget the first time you heard a truly professional orchestra performing. I think it's such a beautiful sound. Um, and, uh, even even that beautiful sound and experience can't always exactly be um, captured by microphone and uh, and movie. So mm -hmm. um, so we all miss the the live orchestra experience. But uh, so the whole point of live streaming is to to make as close a representation of that as we can. So we're going to find out how we do that and how to make it as good as possible. Isn't that right? That is right. Yeah, great. So um, before we start talking with the technical team from the LSO, let's just quickly uh, sort of recap on how did Yamaha get in the position of being able to help uh, an organization like an orchestra, not only with professional sound equipment like we see here, but also with grand pianos, trumpets, and, and other instruments. I believe, Tom, you have a history lesson for us. Yeah, it does require taking a little walk down memory lane. Uh, this actually takes us back uh, to, to the year 1886. Uh, and we have here on the right-hand side, that's Torokuzu Yamaha. Uh, now, Torokuzu was, uh, was about 35 years old when he lived in, in the town of Hamamatsu, which is south of Tokyo here in Japan. He lived there and worked there as a medical equipment and a watch repairman. Uh, but then one day, a local primary school asked him to fix their, their broken reed organ. Mm. Uh, and so being the, the go-to guy in Hamamatsu, he took on the challenge. And he said, yes, OK, not a problem. I will repair this. He repaired it. Uh, and then he thought, ah, I could probably make this myself. Uh, and so in 1887, he then embarked on his own, own task of building this organ. 
Now, uh, he, he, he sort of, you know, built this and then he decided that he wanted some verification for this. So uh, he took it 160 miles north back to Tokyo and he presented mm. it to the Tokyo University of Art uh, and Music. Uh, and they took, had listened to it. Uh, he played it for them and they said, no, yeah, we don't think it sounds so great. Oh, uh, no. it, it, it wasn't the best sounding. But in return for his effort and his uh, passion for it, they allowed him to study some of the lectures and some of the, uh, and study music at the Tokyo Institute uh -huh. of Art, um, sorry, Tokyo University of Art and Music. Yep. Uh, and, uh, and then he, he took the things that he learned and then decided to go back to Hamamatsu uh, and start building his own organs once again. So he used an abandoned temple uh, to construct these organs and he hired some carpenters and some cabinet makers uh, and started to create his own uh, his own organs. Uh, move forward to 1889, uh, Japan's education minister asked Yamaha to maintain and construct uh, the, the nation's school's organs uh, and they did and they embarked on the challenge oh and that's nice. really how the story of Yamaha began. Fast forward to, to 1900, uh, the production of upright pianos begins mm -hmm. um, and then moving forward in Yamaha's history, the first, uh, the first Yamaha Music School opened in 1954 and that remains a core part of Yamaha's uh, passion for music is, is teaching the younger generation, same as the London Symphony Orchestra in that sense. Yeah. Uh, we then had the first electronic organs in 1959, the first wind instruments in 1964, and then to allow for the change in all the more upcoming electronic instruments, we had the first PA systems in 1973. Fabulous. Doesn't that look so different to... Uh, it looks a little different. <laughs> ...what we had before us now, yeah. The item that is uh, keeping Tom and I socially distanced is a Rivage PM3 console. The Rivage being the kind of flagship professional audio range from Yamaha. And this is the kind of equipment that is being used uh, at the London Symphony Orchestra's venue as well, isn't it? Which you will see in a video film we have made in just, uh, in just a moment. But first, let me tell you, you can ask a question if you like. If you are watching us on Zoom, please use the Q and A. Go there and type, type a question and uh, we'll do our best to answer it for you before the hour is over. Um, so yeah, ask us about the, well, about the products that are used, about the process of live streaming audio with video, um, and uh, we'll see what we can do for you. Anyway, let's watch this film, because uh, Tom and I uh, and our filming colleague Tim went to the LSO St. Luke's, met the technical crew there, including Peter Mycroft, technical manager, who will be joining us for the Q&A session. Um, and we discovered uh, all about how they had to transform their venue and find out about that process. Let's watch. So I'm with Peter Mycroft, the LSO St. Luke's technical manager. We're in this beautiful building. Peter, before 2020 gave us this curveball, what was this venue used for? Uh, an awful lot of different things, really. Um, we're the home of the LSO Discovery Program, which is our uh, education and community outreach work, um, working with all sorts, of, all sorts of communities, all sorts of different groups of people, um, bringing sort of music making and kind of hopefully life-changing experiences through, or life-empowering experiences through music, um, but also fulfill a wide range of um, public program and kind of private corporate hire and other, other things like that, kind of seven days a week, uh, as well as supporting the orchestra in its primary rehearsal work, um, usually in collaboration with the Barbican down the road. Right, I see, yeah. So there's plenty of activity going on here that could require sound equipment. Then. Yes, <laughs> yep, um, and yeah, usually kind of changed around on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, supporting such a wide range of events. Uh, we may well go from a um, go from a small seated audience um, uh, as part of a, a live broadcast, uh, Radio Three uh, here most weeks. In fact, we're kind of standing in front of um, a Radio Three set up right now um, for a lunchtime concert series. We may go from that uh, one day into a completely open floor, catered, seated event um, with maybe for a product launch with a projector screen in and integrating VT and lectern mic and things like that. And 
How have activities changed since March 2020? Yeah, um, as far as uh, event um, output goes, yeah, we really dropped anchor in March. It kind of everything ground to a complete halt, um, which for the whole industry, kind of nationwide, globally, really, uh, which is um, a pretty intimidating scenario to be in. Um, although, um, uh, being a, a pretty flexible venue space, we were soon trying to think about how we could um, react to support the orchestra and the existing work that we were doing. Um, we, we really have focused on how we can support the orchestra and its membership in that kind of music creation mission that, um, that the organization's on. So, yeah, we're looking at how we can maybe integrate digitally and uh, record and stream performances. Uh, which was a turnaround in itself, as whilst this space has been used for lots of rehearsal facility in the past, uh, getting to the point where you can capture that effectively to create a digital product is a yeah, whole, new, whole new realm and one that we're taking on now, learning all the time. Indeed, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so some recording would have taken place here before, I suppose, but pretty much now it, it is the LSO's live streaming venue, yes? Yes, that's pretty accurate. Um, so yeah, recording will have taken place, although largely on a small scale, um, almost in yeah, kind of chamber or solo recitals. It's a beautiful acoustic, as I know we were talking about earlier. Um, one that we actually, uh, so it's the, the refurb of the building space was, um, was taken on with a lot of detail and attention paid to the acoustic. So all of the roof panels are kind of asymmetrically aligned, the same with the window panes. Um, we've got a kind of an active controllable acoustic banister um, system over three levels, both walls and the ceiling, uh, that can make a kind of, yeah, a really big impact on the recording acoustic, well, the performance acoustic and, of course, the recording acoustic. Mm -hmm. um, but now we're looking to make use of that on an orchestral scale. So, I and mean, we're standing under a bit of a forest of sherps at the moment. Yeah. But, um, <laughs> so, yeah, there's, uh, we've got this gantry that we can make use of, so there's a lot of suspended mics. Um, but, the, yeah, the PM system has allowed us to kind of um, take what we can create and what we can capture in this room and work with it within our own building in a more flexible way than we were able to do before. Mm, brilliant. So how have technical workflows had to change since March? From a, from a performance perspective, we've got a, a kind of a dedicated stage management team who are trying to keep our performers safe. Um, and there are various um, control mitigations that are in place. We've got some sort of bespoke created stand um, apparatus that um, keep the musicians uh, kind of uh, at least partially isolated uh, instead of uh, having to wear a face covering, although at different times following government advice that's been kind of used in combination. Mm. Um, some that kind of isolate performers side to side as well as the kind of acoustic um, protection options. Right. Uh, but then of course our, um, on the public side our capacity has completely changed, um, right. like almost every venue. Um, mm. uh, although excitingly for the first time yesterday we were able to have our largest live audience in the building at the same time as the orchestra, which was, um, which was a really big waypoint for us. Mm. Okay, good. Yeah, let's hope that can continue. Yeah, the obviously, more the merrier. Obviously, <laughs> well, <laughs> safe, safety the safe, first. The, yeah, uh, yeah. Yeah. So yeah, there have been a lot of perspex, clear perspex screens um, on, on the music stands. I've there have, yeah. For, uh, for the strings, fairly uniquely, that's, um, that's a, a real change as strings within an orchestra obviously usually present as desks in pairs. Right, and yeah. so they're all, as sections, experiencing, I mean, maybe not for the very first time, but for the first time within an orchestra scenario, that they are as individuals within a section, which presents challenges for them as an ensemble kind of with their kind of section adherence and then also kind of quite unique challenges for trying to get the density of sound um, right. from a, from yeah. a mic yeah. perspective yeah, as well. Yeah, they sound a little different. But yeah, the, the, the lead violinist won't have his page turner colleague by his side, will he? <laughs> yeah, that, yeah, so the page turning <laughs> presents quite a unique challenge again. Uh, and actually in some of our more recent um, rehearsals and performances, we've kind of reapproached what a, an orchestral layout is with um, kind of historically the conductor is always uh, kind of in line with the front row, the front desks of, uh, of strings. 
um, either um, the two sets of violins or violoncello, depending on your arrangement. And, um, and now that uh, in order to kind of fulfill the distancing imperative, we're actually fanning the strings out around the conductor. So the conductor's almost getting a kind of 270 degrees of strings around them, um, <laughs> which I think there, there have been kind of various attempts at this sort of thing in the past, but it's kind of just another example of how we're trying to meet the challenges creatively. Right, yeah, it's a new experience for everyone. Yeah, yeah, yeah redefining really, what a concert experience is, yeah, really. Yeah. I'm talking to Jack Jordan, Ella Sosa and Luke's senior technician. We're in the Gamelan room, and if you look behind him, you may be able to see why. Uh, Luke, can you tell us what was this room used for before March 2020? Uh, before all this happened, this would be used by community groups uh, that would come together and learn and perform Gamelan instruments and techniques, all of the stuff you see behind me and more behind you would like fill this room. There'll be 20 or 30 people all playing gongs and little instruments uh, yeah. together. And then occasionally it'd be used for like a breakout room for other uh, pieces or other days. But generally it was sponsored by a gamelan enthusiast and then therefore is the gamelan room. Mm. Yeah, it looks like some fantastic instruments. I want to get yeah. my hands on those gongs later. <laughs> but uh, we can hear some rather un-Gamelan kind of background noise here, which is obviously vision mixers and so on. So it's gone from the Gamelan room to the gallery. Absolutely. Bed. Yeah. So, yeah, can you tell us how this room was transformed these last six months? Uh, basically, we had to remove all the Gamelan instruments to create space, uh, and we needed... Uh, a room that was spatially distanced so that we can have operators and directors without being too close to each other. This was obviously the perfect room for that. And it also has uh, holes in the, in the walls to, go, to get cables through to the, to the hall. So it was the perfect place for the, uh, what is now the, referred to as the Garrelly. Mm. Uh, but basically we've gone from a couple of renditions of what you see now. This is the latest edition of the camera install and we had hired a load of equipment previous to that to run our summer shorts season and then the other side made the investment to purchase the cameras the, the vision mixers the uh, matrices right yeah yeah because it, it seems like there's more seasons to come from uh, <laughs> within it looks within like this it. venue yeah possibly yeah and so for a typical live stream how many people are working in this room on the full orchestral projects, uh, there's at least a uh, camera director, the vision mixer, maybe a score reader, uh, three camera operators. Um, if there's a, a live stream, there's a live stream monitor, a production engineer in the room. So anywhere between seven and 10 on a, on a busy day. Wow. And how has the sound system had to be adapted for live streaming? It's had to be adapted uh, to be very flexible because each live stream has had different requirements I see. and different needs of live stream and recorders and internal room sound. Uh, they might not necessarily need the announcement mics that are in the hall to the live audience. So having the flexibility with the PM10 to send different feeds everywhere and anywhere was, was hugely helpful. Did it take you a long time to sort of get to grips with that or to, to set it up? Um, not not as long as uh, not as long as the camera system has taken us to, <laughs> to build. Um, myself and Pete are both sound engineers from a previous background, so all the terminology was was the same, even though it was like Yamaha branding or other. Uh, so the actual integration of the sound system wasn't wasn't a big challenge to us. It was uh, refreshing how easy it was to actually adapt.
Jack, we're now in the sound gallery, or what what is now called the sound gallery, and we've got the Rivage PM10 here. How has this new equipment helped you to adapt and improve the facilities at LSO St. Luke's? Oh, uh, the list is so long. Basically, our old system, uh, all of the inputs and outputs were maxed out. So whenever we needed to record anything, it wasn't easily done and it would take a lot of time and effort to either undo it and then redo it. So instantly with the Dante system, we've been able to not only multi-track record uh, the ensembles or the orchestra very easily onto a computer, but we can multi-track record here, next door. We can send different feeds to the, uh, the hall, to the recorders, to local uh, amplification very easily at the click of a button and it's eased the workflow tremendously. Okay, so your flexibility has increased. Oh, hugely. Yeah, so I believe you've had this mixing desk in various rooms yep. during the last few months, yeah? <laughs> and like, there's literally been a case of unplugging the twin lanes, moving it to the other room, plugging it back in, the system is there and intact. Also here, you have to interface with recording equipment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, how is that done? Uh, currently, it's done over um, Dante over Maddie in the back of the uh, DSP. Mm. And previously, we had a separate split from the PM10 going to the Maddie stream at 96K. And then we sent a separate uh, Dante stream to the BBC over 48K. And that was easily done. Same process, just drag and drop the matrix the outputs yeah great so the sample rate converter inside uh allows does the job to, very well yeah allows you to share <clears throat> multiple sample rates multiple networks yeah uh, without any clocking problems exactly yeah Beautiful sounding orchestra, happy looking engineers too. Yeah, very happy. Yeah. And when, uh, when I first watched the live stream of that concert, that was Beethoven's Fifth Symphony, it was uh, performed with some other pieces, wasn't it, as well? And it was wonderful just to see how kind of happy and content Simon Rattle, the conductor, <laughs> looked. Um, it's in his natural environment. You know, during the performance, <laughs> I think, yeah, so glad to be able to be... Uh, conducting an orchestra again and uh, yeah, definitely. I, I think the whole orchestra were mighty relieved to be able to to get together even though under different conditions to be able to perform music again so that's wonderful to be able to see we will hear more from jack a bit later and more from peter because peter who we saw uh, at the beginning of that video will join us live for our q and a session a bit later so if you have any questions please type them into zoom using the q and a facility and we shall address as many as we can later thank you michael from the philippines for your question which we will talk about a little bit later too so but for now tom you got a system diagram for us to show us uh, what components of the Rivage system are being used. Yes, absolutely. Yes. Um, so in the London Symphony Orchestra, it's made up of a number of different different spaces. Their their space in London is a is an old church essentially that they've turned into a, a more of a recording and rehearsal facility, and they have a, a a smaller ten control surface located in a lower room. It's about three floors down from the the, the main uh, sort of rehearsal and production space, if you like. This is connected via twin lane uh, to the RPIO up the top there in, in, in the hall, which has got the hybrid mic preamp on it. Uh, and that's connected via Yamaha's twin lane uh, protocol, which is a proprietary fiber optic uh, network. They are then using a QL1, which is more being used for sort of um, uh, show essential kind of communication and announcements, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and this is then connected via Dante to the switch uh, underneath it. They also have a Rio, which again, as you'll see, is connected via, via a couple of network switches down in the video production room. And this is again doing some communication, some essential uh, sending of the, of the sort of um, program sound, etc., down to the, the video suite. If we have a quick look at the back of the, the DSP, which is the Mix Engine 4, the, the, the 10 system, mm. 
they've got a number of different cards inside this. And this is, I think, a key point about this system is that they've got uh, a twin lane card over there on the right hand side in green, uh, which is obviously used, as I said, for connection to the stage box. They have a Dante card uh, located in the second slot there in red, uh, and this is used for sort of passing off to kind of the local recording and streaming equipment. They have a Maddie card uh, inside the, the third slot there in purple, which can be used for some, or is being used for sending to the post production and the, uh, the recording team, but could also be used for an outside broadcast if it were required. And then they have a sample rate conversion card uh, in the fourth slot in orange there, uh, which is essentially being used for. Or, um, uh, for, for passing off again to an OB truck uh, or perhaps to a, you know, a broadcast system of some kind. Yeah, so the, the fantastic thing with this is that we can link to a range of networks Absolutely. and pass audio from one to the other, share them, work at different sample rates um, at the same time. Yes, absolutely. It's yeah. So that, yeah, the, the team at uh, LSO St. Luke's have greatly appreciated that flexibility haven't they yeah sure. and, it's a very uh, powerful system and very yeah. scalable as well yeah we'll hear more a, li a little bit later and uh, you have been able to go there and actually mix a performance yes i have uh, it's it's a real privilege to be able to actually uh, you know <laughs> hear it through the console as it were mm. i think the unusual thing about mixing an orchestra is that uh, when you're trying to kind of capture the, the sort of sound of the audience, it's very difficult to do with just spot micing each of the individual instruments. When you put a microphone on all the instruments, bring this into the console, create some kind of mixed balance, it's still lacking some kind of um, you know, flavor to it, some kind of real character to the sound. But the venue is quite lucky in the fact that it has this additional microphone array in the roof, which is made up of four microphones, which captures the ambient sound of the orchestra playing in their kind of self-balanced way. So you right. really get a feel of the orchestra and its presence with these additional four channels. So it can go from sounding like a very, very kind of flat and quite soulless mix to dialing those four channels in and it suddenly comes alive. Uh, mm, yeah, really, okay. Really fantastic. Yeah. So you can get a perfect combination of reasonably close mic and ambient mic. Yes, ambient absolutely. Mic to uh, make it feel like you're actually there in a concert hall. Yeah, definitely. Which is uh, a feeling we all crave isn't yes. it? <laughs> these days. <laughs> <laughs> right. We have another video to play from you from LSO St. Luke's. We have more technicians to, to chat with, um, including the guys who do the mixing and the miking for most of the live performances of the orchestra. So we're going to run this. And remember, uh, type some more Q&A for us, please. We've, I've seen a few come in. That's wonderful. Thank you very much. We shall talk more about them later. Let's watch and you uh, ask your questions. I'm talking with Jeremy Farnell, experienced sound engineer who's been working at this venue since 2012. Jeremy, we're standing under this field of Sherp's microphones. Is this a typical setup to what we'd use on a, on a chamber music recital? I think it, it probably is. Um, but the thing about St. Luke's is we've got a fantastic inventory of microphones. So we've mm. got, um, I think, eight or nine uh, KM184s. We have Sherp's. We've got 58s. Really, when I have an artist in front of me, I can pick and choose exactly what I want to use, and that's a very luxurious position to be in. Yeah, so uh, I imagine there's quite a, quite a few different experimental musical setups that, that happen here. So <laughs> what, what kind of stories do you have about that? Well, one of the most notable events were, involved an instrument called a Kraken harp, and that was a specially made harp. It had various springs attached to different parts of the instrument and what could be described as um, transducers that looked like tin cans. Mm -hmm. And the composer in question uh, wanted each uh, transducer mic'd up and then he wanted to position the sound from those uh, transducers in a surround situation. The audience walked in uh, and they sort of promenaded and walked around the performance. So uh, in situations like that, it seems like the performance is kind of tailored to suit the, the venue itself. Very much so. Uh, 
on that particular performance that we were talking about, um, we could position the sound at any, any one of six speakers within the room. And at that time, we were using the Yamaha M7CL, and that worked perfectly, uh, using the matrix outputs to be able to position any transducer from the Kraken harp to any speaker in the room. So I'm talking with John and Neil from Classic Sound, and uh, it's a pleasure to have you join us because you've been working with the LSO for around about two decades, <laughs> I believe. So you have a wonderful amount of experience um, working with orchestras. So I, I would like to know, how do you mic up a socially distanced orchestra? Um. It, is a, it has been a bit of a challenge, and it's still a, bit, a little bit of a learning curve. Primarily, classical music is very much acoustic bass. So we are looking to capture not just the musicians, but the musicians within the acoustic. Um, the problem we have found, as a general rule, is that um, uh, with a socially distanced orchestra, because they are so much further apart uh, than they normally are, and like the woodwind and brass are at least two meters, I think the um, strings are 1.5 with face masks or mitigation, that that is a long way away from where they normally um, sit. So what we've found is we've ended up, um, and for classical recording engineers, this is a bit of a sort of um, new departure. We end up putting out quite a lot more spot mics just to pick up a little bit of focus because what, that's what we've lost in terms of the distance they are now away from us. Um, and in terms of the balance, um, likewise, we'd still have got um, an array of mics across the front of the orchestra that pick up the main sound with the acoustic, but we're more reliant on our sort of little s sniffy spot mics just to give us a little taste of what they're offering. Yeah. Right. I mean, if, if, if you think about it, if normally we would capture the majority of the orchestral sound, particularly the strings, with five omni mics across the front in a configuration, and that's normally would consist of 40, 45 string players. Well, we've got less than half of that in the same space, so you're not going to get the same, the same volume and the same kind of um, focus of sound that you would typically get with that array. So you've got to kind of reinforce it a little bit somehow without it sounding like you've reinforced it artificially. I see, yeah. Are, are you using the same types of microphones as before? Uh, generally, yes. Um, I think, as Neil said, we, we rely on some a combination of Neumann 50s and some uh, Sherps MK2Ss across the front of the orchestra. Then, across the string section, um, we're primarily using the, the Sherps uh, wide cardioid, the MK21, which gives quite a nice warm sound, but you can get quite close with it and get a bit of focus. Um, then on the rest of the orchestra, the woodwind brass percussion is a combination of uh, Neumann and Sherps mics, but they tend to be more cardioid mics. So um, just for a little bit of uh, a little bit of a you know attention to detail, just a little bit of you know fizz, as it were. But we're still not like it's still not a case of miking every single instrument. We're still trying to kind of, although we're going in closer than we would do normally, it's still a more of a zone kind of approach than a, putting a mic on every single player. One other thing I was I was interested in now, mixing for for TV or or for live streaming when there's picture, do do you find yourself varying the sound you're creating to to accompany the picture, or, or are you trying to make that not influence you at all? Yeah, it, it is a slightly different approach in that we generally go for. Um, the same generic sound, possibly with a, I don't know, another 5% more focus than we would do normally. But the, what we have to do is we have to follow the, the broadcast picture um, because um, if, for, for example, suddenly on the screen you see a close-up of an oboe player or whatever, you need to be able to slightly highlight that in the mix in order to marry the pictures. If you don't, if you don't it's, it's the brain sort of... Um, 
the brain sees it in, in the wrong way. It see it hears an unfocused sound without, but um, by seeing the oboe in front of you, you don't see the focus on it or hear the focus on it. So you just have to mix with, alongside the picture and sort of ride the mix through. Really, um, we do we do get a dress rehearsal so that we normally have got a pretty good, good idea of when things are going to come up. But yeah, you just have to um, be aware of the picture at the time. It's not a radical thing; it's quite a subtle thing. But we are that's what we have to do. How do you decide, you know, whether to bring out the acoustics of the venue in the recording or to try and keep it sort of dry and natural? Well, we tend to, we sort of have got a pretty good idea of the acoustic before we head into these things. And if it's a, generally, if it's a, it's a, if it's a pleasant acoustic, then we do try and capture that. Um, and the St. Luke's acoustic is a pleasant acoustic. So uh, we've got to be a little bit careful. You can't sort of take all the acoustic in, um, but we do capture that. Um, but on the, uh, uh, by the same token, because of the distance that the players are away from, from each other, they're finding it really difficult to play together in time, in tune or whatever. So we do tend to be a little bit tighter um, just so that we can compensate for such things as that. Um, but no, we, 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 we do try and capture the acoustic. Um, I mean, the, 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 technique we, the techniques we've always used rely on kind of a main array of omni mics. And it's a case of putting them in the right position that gets the correct relationship between direct and sound and acoustic. Uh, so it's not a case of putting mics up to capture the acoustic and mics up to capture the instruments. It, it's, the mics do both at the same time and it, the skill is in, in uh, if there is any skill, <laughs> is, in, um, is in getting that relationship correct in, in where you put them and you tend to vary that a little bit as John said depending on how good the acoustic is and um, you know whether the acoustic's sympathetic to an orchestra or some acoustics aren't terribly sympathetic they can be quite boomy and you know in which case you might want to cut them out a little bit more than you would do normally. Because also the other thing we're trying to do is we're trying to we're trying to create some depth into the recording so that everything doesn't uh, doesn't sound or appear as if it's in the one plane. So ideally, what we're trying to do is capture a, a big warm string sound at the very front of the orchestra, and then we layer the woodwind and the brass and the percussion so that you hopefully you hear a little bit of, of depth to the sound that, that it's not all in the same perspective. Yeah. Um, that's that's the tricky bit. That's actually the, the the real. That's the sort of icing on the cake. Yeah, and that that that's why we tend not to go really close with lots of spot mics, because you'll find if you do that, you you get a very two dimensional sound, and it's very hard to get any depth and perspective in things. Mm, okay, but w would you ever delay the spot mics then of, um, of the orchestra that's further back from the conductor? Sure, we do. Yeah, um, you know, we we often um, we often turn in a, a little bit of delay depending on the layers and how far they are away. I mean, some some inherent delay is good because that gives you a bit of depth. So you don't want to take all the delay out. But if things are, if you've got too many mics and there's lots of different information coming in, adding delays in can clean things up quite a lot. Yeah, I I can imagine. Um, another question I was wondering about is, is how important is it to um, be able to follow the score of the music while you're mixing? Sure. Normally we work in, normally we work in pairs um, because, um, especially on a TV show as well, you need, even if you know the music reasonably well, you need a couple of prompts as to what might be coming up in order to um, in order to follow the TV picture and give that little extra bit of focus. I wouldn't say it's um, I wouldn't say it's you know it's an absolute must, but it's an advan it's a really is an advantage if you've got someone with with you who can read the score, just give you a little bit of guidance, a few pointers. Um, you don't want you know what's coming up every single bar around the corner, but you just want a little bit of guidance. Do you have any tips for coping with such the wide dynamic range that uh, you are given through the orchestra? Uh, that's quite a tricky one because um, I guess because we've grown up with it over such a long period of time, we've just got used to it. And we, we, 
it's a sort of almost a subconscious thing now that we, the way we mic things, we know there's going to be a large dynamic range. The only, um, the only slight problem is that with a, with a lot of sort of um, broadcast, m social media, all these sort of things going out, more often than not, dare I say it, we're actually asked to sort of slightly squash that dynamic range so it's not as big as it, it perhaps could be. Uh, like for our core LSO product, which goes out on SACDs, we, we try and make it the widest dynamic range possible because that's what the audio file wants. You know, it, that's an ideal world. But for a, a lot of other things, um, we still mix in that vein. But if we know where the product is ending up, often we do actually sort of put a little bit of limiting and compression in in order just to squash that down so it sits a little bit more comfortably for that medium. Um, but yeah, no, it is quite a wide dynamic range okay. in, in classical music and you do need to be, and that's another reason why it's quite useful to have a score reader next to you so they can warn you of what might be coming down the line. Yeah, certainly also if you're mixing for TV or, or uh, broadcast, there's an inherent amount of natural compression you put in when you're mixing so you do because you're conscious of the medium it's going out on you do tend to make the quiets slightly louder and the loud slightly quieter anyway naturally when you're mixing um, so it, mixing isn't a, it isn't a completely static thing you know there, there's a there's a lot of ebb and flow in it and you don't you don't just kind of set the faders and say well that's a perfect sound and you know because it's you Inevitably, what you're dealing with is a compromise. So, um, and it's always best, we think, that the compromise is made in a human and artistic way rather than a technical way. Yeah. Um, I, I wonder if you have any opinions about the, the preamps that are in the Rivage PM10 system that you've been using the last, uh, the last few events in, in, in St. Luke's. Have you, have you, have you had a particular uh, thought about them? Uh, sure. To be honest with you, uh, from the classical world, what we what we tend to really like um, is just clean, unadulterated signal. We don't want any coloration or anything. And t to be fair, uh, from what we've been hearing, um, you know, the uh, the mic amps with the with the Yamaha systems, uh, you know, have been, have been delivering that. It hasn't been a problem. Um, we're not aware of you know them being either coloured or you know slightly one way or, or the other. I'd agree with John, the mic amps, I mean we we like mic amps that just make what's coming out the microphone louder. That's all it has to do uh, and it has to do it invisibly and they, they seem to do that, yeah. Thinking back a few months, then, <laughs> what was your first impression of the Rivage PM10? My first impression was I heard, oh, it's just like every other Yamaha desk you've used. I was like, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> it looks like it looks like it, but it wasn't. And then I, once I got familiar with it, then I understood it is based on the old Yamaha system and the look of the screen and this section was very familiar just with all the added bells and whistles. Uh, it's a, a lovely desk to walk up to. It's not, not, it's not hard to engage with if you've never seen one before. Okay, so learning the mixing process on this is not that different from other Yamaha mixers? No. You found? No, yeah. um, uh, like for instance, the, the mix and matrix sends there, just very familiar to the old PM range. And if you've used a broad, range of Yamaha desks, then you can definitely walk up to this and find it not challenging. Yeah, great. Because there, there was a Yamaha desk here before, wasn't there? Yes, anyway. the, uh, the M7. Yeah, yeah. So this is obviously way larger with a lot more facilities. Yeah. What would be your favorite kind of new f features you found in the Rivage system? Uh, favorite features, definitely uh, the ease of the workflow. And I literally had to think about what I wanted to achieve. And then it was very easy to find how I did that. Uh, other desks, not as simple, lots of button pressing. 
Uh, for instance, I, I needed to create some user-defined keys to monitor different record sends without interrupting the live stream or overlaying that with other other audio system. Mm. And that was just very simple to, to navigate. Yeah, great. And you've not come across any limitations with the... Uh, I don't think I could come across the limitation. <laughs> uh, the, the numbers that this could do are vast and enormous. Mm. Jack, how has this helped you to adapt and improve the sound facilities within LSO St. Luke's? The integration of the Dante network has been the most flexible I think this building has ever been. Literally at the press of a button, someone can change their requirements and they go, that's fine. We'll just send you this different feed and then job done. Uh, the different the difficulty with the live audience and then the streamed audience, like I said, they, they have a different experience because the live audience have, uh, there'll be certain announcements made to them, but the audience online don't need to hear that. So having the flexibility to separate those, those audio feeds and again, the record feeds separate to that, it's been very, very useful. Mm, okay. Now, um, I think, You've got a great job here, and you've, you're one of the privileged sound engineers who's been able to keep working these last I am. Six, Very six, privileged. six months. Um, could I ask, how, how did you get into this privileged position? <laughs> uh, I did a degree in technical theatre yeah. a long time ago now, and uh, that gave me a very broad spectrum of uh, interests and uh, abilities. And then for previous jobs, I've been a sound engineer, a lighting designer, things like that, and just kind of found my way to this point where um, this presented a new challenge that I hadn't previously been that uh, aware of, and this is what's brought me here today. Mm. And how then did you first learn or experience uh, getting to mix an orchestra? It's uh, It's tricky to to get to learn to mix an orchestra. Right. There aren't as many opportunities, especially now. Mm. Uh, my previous job presented that, uh, uh, unknowing to me that that was going to become a more regular thing. So the LSO, for example, have had a historic relationship with other sound engineers who would come in with the orchestra, and I would learn techniques and mic techniques and that from them and placement of things because uh, it's a bit different to using doing like a rock band. Uh, and then other orchestras wouldn't come in with the sound engineer. So then I would be given the opportunity to mix them using the techniques from the previous engineer. And that was my foray into classical mi mixing or engineering. Yeah, okay. So yeah, l learning the process by, uh, by watching others. Exactly. Who, who already have the experience. Yeah, yeah. wonderful. Well, we've... We've enjoyed so much watching a lot of the, the live streams uh, through, through the internet by various means, and uh, we're looking forward to a whole lot more. So uh, there, there'll be lots more. Yeah, thank you so much for letting us visit and see what you get up to here. Yeah, beautiful stuff. Beethoven's Fifth Symphony, uh, played by the London Symphony Orchestra. I wish we could listen to more of that <laughs> for longer, but you can find a lot of clips from LSO on their YouTube channel. I'll tell you the link a little bit later. Uh, now, Tom, uh, and Peter is now with us. Peter Mycroft, who was in the first video. He has joined <laughs> us uh, live through Zoom via his home. So. We're doing a Zoom into a Zoom. <laughs> yeah. Hi, Andy. Hi, Hi Peter. Yeah, thanks for joining us again. Um, now, uh, Tom, Tom was telling me uh, recently, you know, when, when he came to join you and mix uh, that concert, there was also Dvorak's Slavonic Dances, and he had, he had a bit of trouble with one particular instrument in, in the orchestra, didn't, didn't he? Or didn't you, Tom? Uh, I what, did. what do you remember about that? Uh, it, it, it was uh, quite a loud triangle, we should say. Now, I don't know if it was deliberately played loud or whether it was just the way that the, the, the room was um, 
laid out, but I found that there was something about the really uh, kind of high... Oh, what? Where'd you get that from? <laughs> a bit like that, was it? Yeah, well, I, you didn't have that this morning, so uh, you found a, found, a, found a triangle. Anyway, the frequency <laughs> range of that particular triangle was just uh, bleeding into, into everything else. So you find that you have to balance out, um, it, you know, sort of six channels as opposed to just one channel to try and keep, keep a control on it. So, yeah, um, and whether those perspex screens were sort of adding to the flat surfaces in the venue to sort of make it bounce off it a bit more, I'm, I'm not sure. But right, there's much okay. debate about how to, how to trim out a triangle. Well, <laughs> sorry for bringing back those bad memories. Uh. <laughs> Is this a Yamaha triangle? I don't know. It was bought for me by my mother-in-law from somewhere in France. That's... All I know. Um, <laughs> anyway, yes. <laughs> Wonderful. Let's, let's move on to some... Well, no, just before we move on to some questions, let's find out from Peter a, a little bit more about the, the, the way the video system is put together and how it's all synchronized with the audio because we've got a nice kind of diagram of, the, of how the gallery is set up. Peter, could you talk us, talk us through? And um, I know it, 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 it was uh, quite a process, wasn't it, to, to get all this set up? Uh, during the year? Yeah, fair to say. Um, we were, uh, I mean, like all venues, our whole industry really kind of plunged into this very challenging realm um, at the beginning of the year. Uh, and we were faced with yeah, turning the, the venue from a rehearsal space into a streaming capable uh, venue to support the orchestra. Um, the, yeah, I think you can see on the screen here the the, the fairly hastily drawn together. Uh, apologies for the lack of colour coding or clarity. Um, the system that we have in place now at St Luke's, which in short is uh, some Panasonic uh, PTZ remotely operated cameras, uh, UE one fifties. Uh, so there are four K capable unit, although. 1080, mm -hmm. um, just because of the data management side, really. Uh, so that those are controlled remotely, um, also with some Panasonic equipment, because one of the chief challenges is de-densifying people within the performance space, so the cameras have to be operated remotely. Yeah, of course. Um, those inputs go via a, a kind of matrix distribution control through a Blackmagic studio switcher, which is used by the director and with the assistance of their show caller, sometimes a score reader as well, depending on the complexity of the repertoire, um, to create the program output, which you can see with the, uh, the subtle arrow program <laughs> output to web. <laughs> um, for, the, uh, for the flexibility of the, the post event edit, which we always try and retain, we do capture a selection of the cameras in isolation to be able to then put that program back together if there were any uh, any patching to do um, from a video or an audio perspective. And then we've got a, a Rosendahl Nano Sync, uh, which emits various um, uh, various kind of uh, synchronizing forms uh, to to hold everything together. Brilliant. Um, let's let's move on to some questions because we've had some great questions, and interestingly enough, they are all quite similar to, this, to the questions we received in the earlier sessions when we were running this webinar at other times to reach audiences in Asia, India, uh, Europe, and so on. And uh, one of them is perhaps related to what you've just talked about, and that's how, how do you make sure um, audio and video are aligned you know, with time, lip, lip sync, so to speak? Um, I suppose we're firstly we're we have the benefit of this not being a kind of a pop up system where we have to kind of uh, anticipate what the later to be and have it sorted. Go, we ha the system has been in place for some time, uh, and we've been able to 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 work on exactly how much delay should be added to the uh, to the audio stream coming back from the gallery uh, in order to keep it in time with the. Uh, with the video, uh, the audio is actually then embedded onto the video stream uh, at the point it gets uh, pushed to web. Mm. Um, but it's yeah, we it's a pretty straightforward um, addition of delay to the audio stream at the output stage. Yeah, all right, and that that's quite stable for you then, I imagine, because you're always using the same equipment in the same venue. 
yeah and the um and the 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 cam the camera system the 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 nano sync in the gallery that i mentioned before is outputting black and burst to the to the audio mix station which then uses that to as an external reference to sync their their word clock yeah uh, so yeah the 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 signals are locked together really in that way fabulous yeah an another question which is a popular one is um how do you manage the loudness and peak levels you know is there a specific level metering um uh chart that you observe or uh how how is it done to make sure you don't overload or make or have things too quiet um, yeah, for all the times this question gets asked, I hope I'm not getting worse at answering it. Um, <laughs> I suppose this is one of the areas in which um, the the really wide dynamic range in classical music is actually probably something that assists us in, in this way because the goalposts that we're aiming for aren't the same as you would find in a lot of contemporary music or advertising, say, where that kind of post-production process is looking to hit the kind of the maximum achievable average loudness over time. Um, so we're aware from the, from the repertoire. And I know John Neal mentioned in their video that they have a leader there during, well, they kind of share the responsibility between them. Um, so we, we know the repertoire where the bits are coming up. <laughs> and we've, we've kind of that during rehearsal. So we we do try and stick cl stay clear of any artificial um, compression or or limiting in that way, and it's a, a far more kind of organic human process, as I know Neil touched on in the video. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, we we were discussing earlier, sort of off offline, weren't we? That it is quite a different process than what you'd have with pop music or with a uh, advertisement or something. You're not just trying to make it as loud as possible without clipping, are you? You're trying to make it as natural as possible. Would that be fair? Uh, we, of course, want. Yeah, we we want to get the the greatest level of um of of signal and and high definition out to the yeah. out to the audience. But the the audience for classical music is by and large expecting that wide dynamic range. Mm. So whilst we are whilst we monitor in various hardware and software means. Uh, through to the point that it goes to stream. Of course, there's there will be various um, third party processing that we aren't in control of, depending on who your streaming partner is. Um, we're, yeah, you're correct to say we're we're not aiming to get the loudest possible average signal the whole time. We we really are respecting the dynamic range of what's created in the room. Yeah, yeah, and so often you're dealing with undocumented algorithms let's say of of the uh of the <laughs> streaming uh platforms so uh, we're dealing with it right now aren't we over zoom uh, indeed <laughs> we are yeah. yeah so yeah so so the key is is yeah to to listen and get as much experience as you can or kind of in private before you go public so tra train Absolutely. your ears yeah yeah wonderful now another question we've also been asked uh before uh, there's so much um, plexi uh, around, you know, the the, the screens. Um, how how is that affecting the sound, and how do you compensate? Um, I th uh, I would say, being that we're miking the room space as much as we are focusing on close miking of instruments, it's probably less prevalent than you would be if you were exclusively using close miked signals. Um, unfortunately, with the safety element 2020, you know, we can't we can't do anything about the need to have screens. So they're there whether we like them or not. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and uh, not uh, not ha not having not overly being reliant on close miking really does help in minimizing the impact of those. Mm. Um, yeah. So the, the, the close mics are there to reinforce the the main sound you get from the um, more ambient mics or the room mics. I, I, yeah, I think also if you need to, to pick up solos and stuff like that, it's a kind of a key mm. point to need to just highlight something in the mix quite yeah. nicely, whereas yeah. perhaps we, within the kind of ambient space, you're going to lose this. So Yeah, because uh, yeah. yeah, we, we got another question uh, about this. So how, how do you manage sounds like 
you know, keys on the instruments or, or, or breathing that you wouldn't normally hear in an orchestra setting. But I think, again, the mics are not that close, are they? No. They're, they're not as close as you'd need it in, in, a, in a pop band where you have a lot of loud instruments. No, definitely not. They, the mics are still at least a, a, a meter away from the actual instrument or person in most times. Uh, yeah, uh, that's, that's fair to say. Yeah. Um, and... Uh, yeah, sorry. No, you're, yeah, you're completely yeah, right. Yeah, perhaps uh, <laughs> close miking should not be the correct term. It's, uh, you know, n nearby miking. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> yes, yeah, so zonal, I suppose, is how you would refer to it. Zonal, that's a good... Yeah, that's much right. better. <laughs> yeah, excellent. Um, uh, another, another interesting question is, um, have you produced any pieces that include choir and or vocal soloists? And, and what safety measures have you needed for the singers? I know there has been a piece with um, solo singers, hasn't there? The the, yeah, the, there was um, Bartok Bluebeard's Castle yeah. um, uh, has been part of the season. And actually that was, um, that was quite a nice first for the venue as we were able to actually kind of creatively and almost theatrically use the staircases at the, uh, at the east end of the hall. Uh, so the singers were positioned just really quite far away <laughs> from everybody. Yeah. There's a, uh, in the list of COVID measures, of which there are many at the concert hall, as you can imagine, uh, mitigations and control measures, um, distance is just pretty high up on the list. And um, so we, we haven't yet taken on anything that combines choir and orchestra, although mm. we are uh, attempting to combine that in post-production for one, one show which hasn't been released yet, where wow. we have the choir distanced on their own and the orchestra distanced on their own, <laughs> and that's going to be combined in post-production. Right. Um, but soloists, um, distance, uh, both vocal and instrumental. And uh, interestingly, actually, one of the um, one of the things that we've been experimenting quite a lot with is kind of a creative layout of how the orchestra, the conductor, and the soloists interact. So where you would usually have the, the soloist on the front of the stage facing out into the audience. The audience is now the camera. Um, so we've quite often, to increase the ease of communication, despite the increased distance, had soloists facing back into the ensemble, um, which I think has been posed some new challenges, but also opened some new possibilities. Mm, okay, good. It's always nice to hear there's some positives coming out uh, of, of <laughs> yeah. all the changes. <laughs> yeah. And um, yeah, another positive is so much wonderful content that's available on, on uh, YouTube. And we've just run out of time, but there has been a flurry of late questions come in. So maybe, we can, maybe I'll take a few minutes to try and answer them by typing um, after we sort of close the, the broadcast. So if you have asked a question that hasn't been answered, maybe stay online a few more minutes if you can, and we'll try and type them. But um, before we finish, Tom will be back on the internet airwaves quite soon to give more information about how to go, how to do live streaming with other Yamaha mixers. So Tom, just just give us the dates and the and the information about. Sure. So uh, yeah, we're we're doing a number of different sessions coming up over the next four weeks, uh, starting off with Rivage PM consoles on the twenty fourth of November. Um, you can sign up for these on eventbrite.com forward slash Yamaha. We'll be looking really at some of the the features inside the console to getting the li your live stream sounding a bit better. You know, looking at uh, the delving into a bit about the plugins and some of the you know, just the artistic approach to streaming a bit more. Yeah. Fabulous. Thank you, Tom. Yeah, so if your questions were not answered today, forgive us and join Tom um, on one of those sessions. Yes, and um, final bits of information, how to, find, uh, how to find more of those wonderful performances from LSO. They have a website and they have a YouTube channel there, youtube.com forward slash LSO, where you can catch up on um, quite a few of the, the concerts and, and a lot of kind of chamber music stuff that their musicians have produced um, at home and in studio and so on. It's, it's uh, yeah, wonderful content there. And if you want to learn more about Yamaha equipment, then our YouTube channel is Yamaha 
underscore global. Go there to find out more about uh, Rivage uh, PM systems, for example, and of course, information about musical instruments, uh, home hi-fi audio stuff. You'll find Tom on a few videos. <laughs> you'll, you'll probably find me on a few videos. Sorry about that. Um, <laughs> but that's it. We have run out of time. So thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we want to wish you all the best. Stay healthy, stay safe. And uh, we look forward to seeing you all again sometime soon online. Thank you again, Peter, for joining us. Um, and thank, thank you. you. Yeah, thank you, Tom, for joining us. Thank you, Tim and Ascot on the, the faders and the buttons and the screens at the back of the room. Take care, everybody. Bye for now. <laughs>